and welcome to our panel uh, today. With over half the people on the globe currently living in cities, urbanization has become a major determinant for health in its own right. Cities are places where health can be produced or compromised. The COVID-19 pandemic and its outside impact in cities has forced us to confront this fact with new urgency. Mayors and other urban leaders around the world have risen to the challenge of responding to COVID-19 and continue to make incredibly difficult decisions to protect people's health while maintaining economic stability and social cohesion. City leaders enter the COVID-19 era in, in many cases without a playbook. They have nevertheless mounted a remarkable pandemic response. The Partnership for Healthy Cities has worked since 2017 to support cities to prevent non-communicable diseases and injuries. In 2020, the initiative expanded to respond to COVID-19 with technical support from the Prevent Epidemics Team at Vital Strategies Resolve to Save Lives initiative. And over the past eight months, the partnership has provided over $1 million in financial assistance to cities in the network. This has allowed, us, allowed urban practitioners across the globe to do the following, to launch critical risk communication campaigns, to build on streamlined data sharing systems to track local outbreaks and implement legal guidance on measures that protect health and safety. Cities have communicated with residents in new ways and have embarked on important whole of society collaborations. And I'm inspired to see cities using the momentum of their COVID-19 response to embrace new opportunities to promote healthier, more sustainable systems and behaviors. Looking ahead, we know that COVID-19 will continue to unfold in unexpected ways. Urban areas were already drivers of public health before the pandemic. And once again, they hold the potential to serve as pathfinders for their regions and countries. A very warm thank you to today's speakers, our partners, WHO and Bloomberg Philanthropies, and today's moderator to Dr. Kelly Henning. Now, it's my honor to introduce two champions of the Partnership for Healthy Cities, Dr. Tedros and Mike Bloomberg. Dr. Tedros was elected WHO Director General for a five-year term in May 2017 and has been a leading voice on the pandemic from the start. Mike Bloomberg served as the 108th mayor of New York City and is the founder of Bloomberg Philanthropies. This is an organization whose initiatives have not only accelerated the fight against COVID-19, but have also contributed immensely to improving the quality of life for people, for millions of people around the world. Esteemed mayors, dear colleagues and friends, and my brother, Mike Bloomberg. It's an honor to join you ahead of World Cities Day to mark the incredible urban leadership and collaboration we have seen over the past year. Thank you for your leadership, Mike. The COVID-19 pandemic has upended lives around the globe. And nowhere has the impact of this virus been more evident than in urban areas, home to more than 50% of the world's population. We have seen some cities hit particularly hard by the virus. However, many have fought back with people and leaders uniting to suppress the virus and save both lives and livelihoods. The Partnership for Healthy Cities has built the groundwork for fighting COVID-19 by protecting 
people against non-communicable diseases, a major risk factor for this virus. Many of the mayors here with us today have taken on the role of urban health champions, and their cities have been successful in controlling outbreaks by using a package of targeted measures that we know work. This includes asking people to physically distance, wear a mask, wash their hands, cough safely into their elbows, and meet friends and family outside where possible. Leaders have prevented amplifying events by preventing mass gatherings, tailoring strategies to protect the vulnerable, and empowering, educating, and engaging communities at large. And they have persisted with the critical tools that we have been advocating since day one. Find, isolate, isolate. Test, and care for cases, and, care for cases. and trust and their contacts. Cities have resources and capacity for far-reaching public health action, which is key for the activation of a quick and nimble response. Bold action by city leaders has and will continue to impact the global pandemic response. Today, you will hear about the experience from several cities that continued their efforts to protect their citizens from COVID-19 and keep essential health services up and running. The city of Athens, for example, has been protecting the most vulnerable with food, shelter, and other targeted support for at-risk groups. Meanwhile, the city of Bogota has been looking after its citizens' health by expanding ways to travel safely on foot or bike. Many of you have brought back these lessons learned and shared them through the Partnership for Healthy Cities Global Network. I would like to offer my thanks to our partners in this landmark initiative, Bloomberg Philanthropies and Vital Strategies, and especially to my friend Mike, who has been a champion of public health for decades, especially for non-communicable diseases and injury prevention, and is now providing significant support to cities and countries during the pandemic. We're glad to have partners like this, and we stand ready to support you in the fight against COVID-19. I thank you. Thank you, Dr. Tedros, and hello, everyone. City governments have the power to improve the health of people around the world. I saw that as mayor of New York City when we increased life expectancy by three whole years. To help more cities save more lives, Bloomberg Philanthropies, together with the World Health Organization and Vital Strategies, created the Partnership for Healthy Cities in 2017. By helping mayors implement proven health policies, we are tackling issues like diabetes, heart disease, and road traffic crashes, and saving lives. The partnership now includes nearly 70 cities around the world, including those led by the dynamic mayors you'll hear from today. From promoting healthy food in Quito, Ecuador, to redesigning roads in Accra, Ghana, these mayors are making great progress. We've also been glad to support them in the fight against COVID-19, where their efforts have been so important. And because their most vulnerable residents often suffer from underlying health conditions, our work is more vital than ever. I want to thank them for their leadership, and we're looking forward to making even more progress together. Thank you, Jose Luis Castro, Dr. Tedros, and Mike Bloomberg for those remarks this morning. I'm Kelly Henning. I head the public health program at Bloomberg Philanthropies, and it is my pleasure to join you today as moderator for Vital Talks event hosted by the Partnership for Healthy Cities. 
In just a few moments, I'll be joined by our esteemed mayors for a conversation on an incredibly timely topic, COVID-19 and beyond, cities on the front lines of a healthier future. We really have a lot to cover today, but first I wanna do a few housekeeping items with you. We hope this will be an engaging conversation and spark a lot of interaction. At the bottom of your screen, you'll find a Q&A box, Q and A. Please use this feature to ask questions of our panelists. You can send your questions at any moment during the discussion and during the talk today, or you can tweet your questions to us using the hashtag vital, strategy, vital talks, vital talks hashtag. COVID-19 has brought urban leadership on health into much greater focus. With more than 50% of the world's population living in cities, urban governments have mounted a remarkable response and they continue to face daunting challenges as the virus becomes a longer term reality. We hope that everyone who participates with us today will leave the session with a, a strong appreciation of how critical urban action and collaboration have been and will continue to be during this unprecedented pandemic. We it is my honor now to welcome and introduce the mayors from the Partnership for Healthy Cities, our global network. Claudia Lopez is the first woman mayor of Bogota, Colombia. She's been in her position since January the 1st. Mayor Lopez has proven to be a champion of urban health, working with, to foster a healthy food environment in schools with important adaptations about, during this pandemic time which I hope she'll share with us. We also have Kostas Bakanos, who's mayor of Athens, Greece, and he's been in that position since August of 2019. Facing strict preventive measures imposed by the national government at the start of the pandemic, Mayor Bakanos directed his city government to provide special support to vulnerable communities. And again, I'm hoping we'll hear more about that today. Her worship deputy Doreen Nianjura is deputy Lord Mayor of Kampala City Authority in Uganda. She also serves as an elected local council five woman counselor. Now today we're gonna to jump right into our conversation um, and start by asking questions of our panelists and also collecting questions from all of you in the audience. So let me start us off. I'd like to start with uh, a question that um, I think we're all really wondering about. We've been living with COVID-19 for almost a year. While our main focus for this conversation is to look ahead and to think about the future of health in cities, why don't we start today with what was one of the best decisions that you made as mayor early on in the response to the pandemic? And what was one of your hardest decisions? Let me turn the conversation to Mayor Lopez. Maybe we can start with you and then we'll move on to our other mayors. Mayor Lopez. Well, thank you so much. I'm very glad to be in this panel. Uh, thank you so much for the invitation. I think that the best decision that we made to tackle this pandemic was at the same time the hardest, which was to initiate a lockdown very early. We had the first case in Bogota in March 6th, and we started uh, the lockdown uh, by March 28th. So we started very early. Uh, we had in, in a national lockdown uh, for six weeks, almost until the, until the end of April. Um, and that gave us time, first of all, to sort of control the spread of the pandemic and then to start increasing our health system capacity to prevent the pandemic to overturn our health system. So I think that was the hardest because it has a, a huge impact, you know, in the benefit of healthcare and saving, saving lives, but also was very hard as a hit for our economy. So it was the best, but it was the hardest. Then we, we use the next five months between April and August. Bogota uh, was, was able to double the health system capacity. 
uh, the to double more than double the number of uh, uh, intensive healthcare units uh, in our city. We started with 935 units. We now have 2,200 units. Uh, we started started doing you know 200 tests uh, per day. We're now able to do more than 15,000 tests per day. Uh, and all that was a collective effort with the national government. Even though we have differences with the national government, we haven't uh, you know, stopped working together in this strategy to save lives. You know, we were able to, to have a, a, an, an open and frank discussion when we have differences, but that never impede the collaboration we need to save lives. Um, I think the second thing, the second thing that was the hardest point was we have the first peak of this pandemic in August. Uh, and then we need to do again, not a national lockdown, was a city lockdown. We are an 8 million city. There's a lot of people. Bogota is one of the city, cities more dense in the world. That's very advantageous for many things, certainly not for the pandemic. Uh, that's quite a challenge. So we divided the city by 200, by 2 million people. And we do set up different terms for local lockdowns uh, at the same time that we were passing the first peak. Again, to prevent uh, that we could, the, the, the health system could be overwhelmed, you know, and, and turned down by the pandemic. So we were able to attend every citizen. Nobody in these 8 million cities, cities was left without health care during the pandemic, either for COVID or for other diseases. The third thing is we're a very dense, but a very unequal city. Uh, so at the beginning, since last year, unfortunately, poverty was rising in Bogota and also in Colombia. As you could imagine that in this year, poverty has continued increasing. Unfortunately, you know, we have now, now double rates of poverty and employment than the ones we have last year. At the beginning of our period of this year, zero families receive cash transfers from the mayor's office. Um, around 150,000 families received cash transfers from the national government. Working together, putting resources together, both the city government and the national government, now we are covering seven 1,200 uh, homes with cash transfers. That's amazing. As a network of income support and care and social support for the families, for the poorest families of our city, and also for the, you know, sort of the hidden poverty that was there since last year. And now is a, is a sort of open poverty of people in vulnerability that we were able to support, not only with the health, health system, but also with this social system and network system of taking care of them. Thank you, Mayor Lopez. Those were really interesting uh, points and quite encouraging actually. But why don't we continue to move on because we're um, gonna keep ourselves moving forward. Mayor Bacanos, could you comment on this question? Well, it's been a very tough year, I think for all of us because we have been facing an unprecedented pandemic. And clearly it's an international problem, but it also requires uh, local solutions. And that is where local authorities actually come in. I mean, our strength is working bottom up and our true power is in the streets. So the city of Athens very quickly made a number of calls, uh, which were actually uh, the outcome of a strategic decision, which was that for us, the priority lies with those who actually are the most unfortunate, those who are usually left uh, disenfranchised or voiceless, those who are invisible to the central state. That's why very quickly uh, we set up a special shelter, a home for homeless Athenians. It houses up to 400 people in conditions of dignity. Uh, at the same time, we set up a shelter for uh, drug addicts while increasing uh, street work to make sure that these people re receive the necessary medical attention. Um, we went further, 
we actually set up a new system called Help at Home Plus, which allowed us to actually deliver food, uh, medicine, and aid uh, door to door to tens of thousands of Athenians, not only during the, lo the lockdown, but also uh, as we speak. And we also made sure that in order to be able to uh, respond to the needs of the city, we understood that the city organization had to change. To change. That's why for us, the pandemic was also an opportunity to move forward with long overdue reforms. It was a catalyst, if you'd like. I can mention quite a few examples. Let me just mention one. Uh, we restructured the city organization uh, by uh, giving special emphasis on the digital services that we provide. Uh, if there's one message, I think, coming from Athens, is that, of course, uh, this pandemic knows no boundaries. Of course, uh, this pandemic knows no color, no gender, no nationality. The pandemic does not actually look at one socioeconomic background, but it must be very, very clear that, but that it is a huge socioeconomic issue because the pandemic actually brings into fore uh, the structural um, injustices uh, that exist within our cities, the um, poverty pockets that the mayor um, mentioned earlier. And that, that is where we are obliged to actually uh, put uh, the most attention. Thank you for those important comments. Uh, they're very much appreciated. I do want to ask Deputy Lord Mayor Nianjura to talk about what were some of the hardest things that she faced in Kampala before we move on. Deputy Mayor, De Deputy Lord Mayor. We just need you to, to, to unmute your line. Oh, thank you very much. It's indeed an honor um, for me to address you. Thank you so much for giving me this opportunity. Now, like all other cities, Kampala is no exception. We are also grappling with the challenges that come with the COVID-19 pandemic. Kampala harbors 6 million people during the day and 3 million people during the night. So Kampala is a very congested city making it an active hotspot for the spread of uh, COVID-19. And indeed, out of the COVID-19 cases that have been reported in Uganda, 61% of those, 37% uh, of those cases have come from Kampala. Now, Kampala, Uganda is, uh, belongs to, it's a third world country. But nonetheless, as leaders, we had to make very hard decisions because we wanted our people to survive. Now, one of the hardest decisions that we took was uh, to send our people into a lockdown, well knowing that a majority of them uh, are casual workers. You know, they go and work, then what they fetch from there is what they eat for that day. It's, uh, they do food to mouth. So that was one of um, the hardest decisions that we had to take as leaders in the city. And um, well, it worked and uh, our residents had to choose between either dying because of hunger or COVID-19. And of course, as leaders, we couldn't let our people just go hungry. We had to come in and provide for them food. So we participated in the distributing um, food to several of our residents in the city. And um, that at least helped them survive. And then we also, well, during lockdown, of course, most people here do not own cars. So it was very hard for them to move from one place to another. However, as leaders who love them, we had to take that decision. Now, currently the lockdown has been, um, uh, is, is not as tough as it were. And uh, um, passenger service vehicles then that used to accommodate 14 people currently only carry seven people. That is also a very hard decision and our people have to choose between either walking or using these uh, passenger service vehicles. So there's a lot of um, dissatisfaction from some circles of the people 
but well, we had no choice. They had to really accept that. And also, um, currently, as the leadership at Kampala Capital City Authority, we understand the challenges that the business community is facing. So we had to come up with a stimulus package to support these small businesses that are really finding it very hard to pick up. So we had to choose between losing revenue and supporting these small scale businesses for our people. So some of those hard decisions we have uh, had to take, but uh, they have really uh, helped the situation because we believe it would really be worse. The other decision that we had to take, like I have said, Uganda belongs to a third world country. Many of us have not yet fully embraced technology. So it was very hard for us to convince some of our um, employees to work from home, work online. Um, well, it is still a challenge, but uh, that is the way to go. And I am happy that um, most of our staff are really picking up and they're getting used to the new normal. So, and um, we are pushing on, I should say. And uh, every week as the Kampala Central Executive Committee, we sit down and analyze the situation in as far as the COVID-19 is concerned. And uh, we had schools that resumed um, classes recently, but as KCC, we had to go in and inspect most of these schools and uh, make sure that uh, the SOPs are in place. For those that did not have um, those in place, we discouraged them from opening the schools because we wanted as the students to be safe and that we have really worked on that as well. Allow me end there for now. Thank you very much, Deputy Larry May. You, you touched on something that I think I'd like to ask the other panelists as well. Um, Mayor Bakanos, could you talk about how your citizens responded. I think Lord Mayor just talked a little bit about how hard it was to do those lockdowns in Kampala and how, it, although it was necessary, it was very difficult. Can you talk about what the situation was like in Athens and what kind of cooperation or you received or what measures you took to get more cooperation from your citizens? Well, um, I should start off by saying that um, as you all know, Athens is the birthplace of democracy, and we take democracy extremely seriously. I mean, we are very fond of dialogue and debate. But what happened uh, in this uh, context is actually quite interesting. Um, we actually prioritized facts, uh, science, and truth over politics and partisanship. We actually placed um, expertise over populism. And it worked. It worked on a national level and it worked on a city level. And it worked on a national and a city level and that enabled us to actually make the tough calls I mentioned earlier, including a lockdown very early on. And as a result, we had great cooperation. We had fantastic cooperation uh, with our citizens, uh, with the Athenians, uh, and we're all extremely grateful uh, to all our people. Having said that, we are now in, in the second wave. So this has been going on for quite a few months. It's uh, actually to be expected that there is a certain fatigue. Uh, there is a certain exhaustion. I mean, let's not forget that we're talking about um, uh, limits on our socialization, to which to a great extent are actually run against human nature, uh, but still, um, this social contract is in place. Um, it's a social contract that uh, revolves around protecting um, everyone's health. Uh, and I remain optimistic that although the winter ahead, uh, you know, it's probably going to be the winter of our discontent, uh, I do believe that we'll be able to, to make it through. Um, and the, which is good news because I think or everyone agrees that there is a strong correlation between how one responds to the pandemic in terms of public health and to how and to how and to what extent the economy can rebound afterwards. Thank you for those comments and it's really important to continue to think about that balance between 
<clears throat> the public health response and the economic real, uh, realities on the ground. Um, we really only have a few more minutes for my questions before we get to the audience questions. We're just gonna speed through a few here. Um, Mayor Lopez, could you talk a little bit about what kind of city exchange with other leaders you may have experienced or participated in, or maybe even give us an example of how interaction with other leaders, uh, particularly other mayors, may have been helpful to you during this time of the, of the pandemic? I mean, I, I really appreciate all the, you know, tables and conversations and panels around the world that we have been invited to. Uh, really nobody uh, knew how to tackle this situation. It has been extremely helpful to talk to other Colombian mayors. It, in fact, it, were, it was the, the 500 Colombian mayors who initiated in Colombia the lockdown. You know, later on the national government joined, but there was an initiative taken by the mayors of Colombia, 500 out of 1,100 mayors that we have in, in the country. And then, you know, I appreciate enormously uh, WHO's, the Pan American Health Organization, different organizations such as Bloomberg Philanthropies, uh, C40, um, Metropolis, um, UCLG. I mean, all that sort of converse, global and local conversation has been extremely helpful to learn, to check share experiences in detail. You know, I've been talking with my dear friend, Mayor of Buenos Aires, for example, of Lima, of Santiago de Chile, of Guayaquil. It has been extremely helpful to help them and to learn from them too. And I think in, in here in Bogota, there have been, in addition to the two things that I already mentioned, three things that have been key important that we have shared with others. Um, the first is, you know, this was a matter of, you know, handling the life and death chances of people. So we decided to do that based on science, as, as our dear friend, Mayor Costa says, based on science and, and rigor. Uh, second, with open source data. I just, I just published to you uh, the open source data of COVID-19. Every Bogota citizen is able to see in real time what is happening how our health system is increasing or decreasing, the UCIs, uh, the healthcare units, everything, all the information is there. Also the social network information, how many people is receiving basic income, is receiving food uh, in every locality, very with all transparency. The second thing is civic culture. This is in the DNA of Bogota, civic culture and the use of bike. And we took advantage of that uh, Bogota's DNA to do pedagogic campaigns, collective action, to teach people how to use uh, different elements of protection and measures of, of self-care. And the third thing is to change, changing and, and deepening the social and environmental contract that is our development plan that was approved in the city. You know, we, ha we haven't sacrificed not one economic or social goal that we, ha we have in our four year development plan. Quite the opposite. The pandemic has allowed us to do it more quickly rather than to change it. Uh, so I think these three things, we added, for example, 85 kilometers uh, to our 550 kilometers bike network in the city to promote you know, more careful and, and, and safe uh, ways of, of mobility in our city. So, so Sharing all these experiences with different measures has been extremely helpful. Thank you for those comments, very much appreciated. I'd like to turn to Deputy Lord, Lord Mayor Nayanjara for a moment. Can you, can you, Deputy Lord Mayor, can you talk in just a, one minute about what piece of advice or hope you would share with other city leaders at this time, at this moment in time? What would be your advice or your or your sharing of a hopeful moment. Deputy Lord Mayor. Uh, thank you very much. Um, the advice I would give uh, other cities is um, to unite and uh, take firm decisions and to consider the lives of those that they represent first. And allow me to talk from the background of um, Kampala where I represent that usually you find we decide to politic instead of uh, saving the lives of those that we represent. 
that uh, yes, we love democracy, but at times we have to do away with the democracy. It's not all the time that we have to go with what the people tell us to do. For example, case in point, in Uganda, people are saying, no, 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 we cannot go into lockdown because we have nothing to eat. No, 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 we cannot go into lockdown because you know, we, we, need, we, we need money. We cannot go into lockdown. You cannot tell us to carry seven people. How are we going to count up for, how are we going to account for that? So as leaders at times, and we need to take firm decisions regardless of the consequences. And we have seen this work in Uganda that at times even had to involve police because we are looking at saving the lives of our citizens. And for me, that should be key regardless. The other things can always come in. We need to unite with the citizens. We need to unite with the technical team. Even us that are in opposition, at times we are forced to unite with government because coronavirus does not only attack those who are in opposition, it does not attack those that are supporting government. It has no color, it has no political parties. So I think we need to unite as leaders with our citizens so that together we can defeat coronavirus. Thank you for those inspiring words. Very, very, very heartfelt. I appreciate that. I'd like to turn now to Mayor Bako Yenes. Could you talk about what you would give for advice to other mayors at this moment in time? Well, um, I would actually pass on an advice I received from an elder statesman, uh, a member of the great generation that actually fought during the Second World War and played a prominent role in Greek politics for decades. Uh, when I actually began uh, my, my career in local politics, he actually said that the most important thing for any leader is to make decisions. Now, out of the 10 decisions, four decisions or five decisions, maybe the wrong decisions. But still, it's better than making no decision. And that's clearly true in the case of a crisis. I mean, clearly, we have imperfect information. Clearly, we face an unprecedented challenge. Clearly, there are times when we feel that we may need more data or we may feel that we may need more time. But at the end of the, at the, end of the day, it's about making the decision, making the call, and hope that it works. Thank you for that. Very much about leadership. Really, really appreciate those comments. Mayor Lopez, you're going to get the last word on this particular question. What advice would you give? Follow the facts and science. I think it's amazing that in 21st century, we're still seeing this debate in some uh, actually very prominent democracies about science. And this is the, the, the center of science. Science we need for health, science we need to tackle climate change. So follow the facts, tell people the truth. What are the, the, you know, the risks that they are facing? And, and, and I can agree more with uh, my dear friend, Mayor Costas, you know, make decisions. You know, that's what in crisis, you were elected for that. You know, use the best knowledge uh, that, that, that you have available, but tell people the truth, give them clear instructions, simple and clear that they can follow. Build confidence. This is not about authority. It's about confidence and assertiveness. Uh, I think as long as we have that, science, leadership, decisions, and assertiveness, uh, we will learn, maybe we will fail in some things and we will learn from it. And we will be, you know, well done in some other things, but at the end we learn and we save lives. Thank you for those comments, Re really very much appreciated. I wanna remind the audience that we are taking questions and answers. So put your questions and answer, qu your, your questions in the Q&A box or send them to us on Twitter, hashtag vital, vital talk. We're going to take some questions from the audience now, and we're going to take them um, uh, as they come to us. So the first question at the moment is for Deputy Lord Mayor Doreen. Can you describe how your efforts interacted with national efforts and what impact the national government's actions had on your city and what you were trying to do? And how do you deal uh, when you need to uh, with your role as a city leader when the national COVID incident response management system is up and running. What is that interaction like? Could you, could you please uh, answer us, answer that question, Deputy Lord Mayor? Mayor, 
I'm sorry, you're on mute. There you go. Oh, I've uh, not got your question very well. Would you like me to repeat it? I can repeat that Thanks. question for you. Okay. Please. The question is really about the interaction between your city and your national government. So how do you see that interaction playing out? How successful has that been? And are there any tips for how to improve that interaction? Well, um, thank you very much. We have, um, I think it has not been that smooth working with the um, uh, um, national team and the KCCA team. We've uh, a number of times had challenges. Uh, and for example, when it comes, when it came to issues of um, financing uh, during COVID-19, we had um, quite a, a budget and um, well, the national we are ne government was never able to remit that money to us and that hindered our work as the local authorities. And two, that uh, being in the capital city and uh, having a government that is not very well equipped as a case is here, we are really very constrained that we had to take up the national work, not only the work at the at KCCA, the work that we are supposed to do, the work that our mandate tells us to do. So it has really not been a very smooth raid. It has been a tough raid. However, for the sake of Ugandans, and since Kampala is in Uganda, we choose to serve everyone. So you have always come in handy to do the work at, of uh, the national leaders at, at KCCA. So it has not been a smooth run, but we have done our best. Thank you for those comments and uh, very, very clear and, and very honest uh, feedback. I want to move on to the next question from the audience, which is to Mayor Bakayanis. How can we optimize health services and systems for our poorest citizens at this time? Well, um, as I mentioned earlier, I think this is where local authorities can actually play a catalytic role. I mean, let's be very clear our health systems are overwhelmed and overburdened. That is, that is a fact. And it's only to be expected. And it shouldn't be a surprise given the situation we're in. So the task for local authorities is actually to be the first line of defense. Uh, I mentioned a few examples earlier. Let me mention a couple more. As we speak, we have test centers in the neighborhoods of Athens. And we haven't chosen those neighborhoods uh, by chance. I mean, those are the neighborhoods where we actually face the biggest challenges. At the same time, we have mobile test centers that go, that move around the city, again, responding to the statistical uh, data that we have about where the problem is actually more concerning. At the same time, there are a number of programs that we are running that are not directly related to COVID-19, but are directly related to health. Uh, for example, make sure that uh, the flu, uh, the, uh, that the flu vaccine, uh, vaccine, sorry, is actually used by as many people as possible. And what we try to do, as I mentioned earlier, is to actually relate to those who are under the radar. For example, uh, let me give you another final example. A big percentage of Athenians um, actually speak other languages other than Greek. So one of our key tasks is actually to be able to communicate with them through social media and other channels, WhatsApp groups, for example, to actually make sure that they get the information that they need and that they also receive those clear instructions that are necessary to protect their health. Thank you for those very, very insightful and clear comments. Uh, very much appreciated. I'm going to move on now to uh, Mayor Lopez. Question for you from the audience. What is the most effective change you implemented to make sure families are supported? I think the social network that we were able to build in these uh, six months also uh, was, was the key point. You know, more than half of the people of our city lives under informality. They don't 
have a, a, a national basic income, they don't reach that level of income. Um, as I, I was mentioned last year, poverty was uh, around 15% of our population. Now it's 26% at the end of this year. So it was not only, not only a challenge to provide health care, but actually social care, basic income, food. Um, as I was mentioning at the beginning, uh, the, the, the mayor's office didn't have a cash transfers program. Uh, we never did it before. The national government uh, did have it, but they covered only 150,000 families. Joining re resources from the local and national government, we are now covering 7,200 uh, 12, uh, 7, homes in our city. So that's an amazing thing for 100,050 100, to 7,012. So that was, the, there was an amazing effort and it's not only for this year, we decided uh, to keep for our four year development plan, a guaranteed basic income for poor families. And we're gonna support that as part of our social and economic recovery. The second thing that was important is to support in, uh, micro and small businesses. Micro and small businesses and commerce, you know, uh, deliver 60% of the uh, generation of uh, um, employment of our city. So keep them and supporting them and keeping them alive uh, has been crucial to provide that social network too, to prevent more unemployment to increase and increase and increase. Uh, in, in July, we have 26% of unemployment. Now we were able to reduce that up to 19% uh, in August. And, and we you know, uh, keep improving on that. Uh, so that's, that's the second thing. And I think the, the third thing is the social contract. I think we have an incredible opportunity you know, uh, during this pandemic and, and, and then afterwards to change things definitely for the better of our cities, to improve you know, sustainable mobility, uh, to live in place this social contract for women, for youth, for poor families, not only with this basic income, but with good uh, quality of uh, uh, university education, for example, for our youth, um, to improve employment opportunities for women, which has been, you know, hit the hardest in this in this economic crisis, has been women. So we created all these. Uh, uh, world city um, system of care you know, to actually relieve women from the uh, un unpaid care that they keep doing in their families and relieve them with time and opportunities for education and employment so that they can come back to the labor market. I think all these measures has, has been important to support socially and economically our population, particularly youth, women, and poor families. Thank you for those comments and for the very forward-looking uh, strategy that you're talking about. It's very, it's very inspiring. I'd like to, uh, I'll, at this point, ask another question to uh, our panelists, Deputy Lord Mayor Doreen. Deputy Lord Mayor, how can we support local health committees uh, to better deliver on their critical urban health prevention and promotion activities? Over to you. Deputy Lord Mayor. Do we have you, Deputy Lord Mayor? Stop keeps breaking, I didn't. There you, there you are, we, we hear you, there you go. Oh, I didn't hear the question. Let's try it again. Um, the question from the audience for you is how can we support local health committees to better deliver on their critical urban health prevention and promotion activities. So the things that they would normally be doing, uh, your health committees in Kampala, how do you support them? Well, um, thank you so much. At KCCA, we have uh, really been so proactive because we understand and we value the work that our medical teams are doing. And uh, key in that is uh, that we had to make sure they have funding and uh, protective equipments and um, transportation to and from the city. 
we actually even had to put a fundraising drive in place because um, initially we had very few ambulances to cater for their work. So we have really been um, supportive. We have a very limited budget, but we have done our best to make sure that our medical team is um, facilitated at least to the level that gives them some bit of, um, some bit of comfort. And uh, of course, we have not only left them to do the work alone, but as political leaders, we have also implemented the efforts of our medical team through sensitizing our communities, how to wear masks, how to take temperature guns, where to run to. Um, we have been moving around on radio stations, on TV stations, on communities through uh, using public address system because you understand that we need to do social distancing. So we have really tried to implement their efforts um, the best way we can. Thank you for that. that that's, that's very uh, inspiring. Um, I, I think that that is going to have to be our last question because of time at this point, but I really would like to thank all of our panelists. It's been an incredibly informative and interesting conversation, and we really appreciate your participation with us today. At this point, I'd like to give the floor to Dr. Etienne Krug, who's the director of the World Health Organization's Social Determinants of Health Department. Dr. Krug's team has played an invaluable role in the creation and implementation of the Partnership for Healthy Cities initiative. And I'm pleased to invite him to introduce our newest collaboration, which is a portfolio of case studies on the urban response to COVID-19. Dr. Krug? Thanks so much, Kelly. Uh, I think you started us off um, paraphrasing here, saying that you hoped people would uh, walk away from this uh, session with a, a clear understanding of how critical mayors are to the health of their citizens and, and, and Mayor uh, Claudia and Lord Mayor Doreen and, and uh, Mayor Costas have done a fantastic job, I think, in highlighting through very concrete examples how important mayors uh, and the city leadership can be because of their proximity geographically to their people, because of their cultural understanding and proximity, because of their ability to work multi-sectorally may be a bit easier than uh, at, at the national level, their impact can be huge. And, and I think we have to learn from uh, those examples as well as from many others. Just a year ago, we had no clue about what COVID was and here we are trying to learn lessons and, and hear what others ha have been doing to address it. So, so WHO with support from Bloomberg Philanthropies and thanks for that, Kelly, We've been looking at, at how cities are responding to the problems of, of uh, getting food, to the problems uh, of marginalized populations in times of COVID, as we've heard, but also you know, how people are dealing with the aging population, how we're dealing with some of the risk factors for other health problems like MCDs, tobacco consumption of the difficulties of uh, physical activity, maintaining physical activity in times of lockdown, and, and we need to learn and we need to disseminate these examples. So, so we have a number of case studies now that we have been collected from a wide variety of cities from, from all continents, from ranging from, from the cities we've had here to Buenos Aires, Lima, uh, Moscow, and, and many other places uh, around the world, which we are releasing uh, tomorrow. And I'd like to invite all of you here joining us on Facebook Live tomorrow at 12. Uh, Geneva time, so East, Eastern, uh, sorry, um, European Central time, uh, to, to hear more about them and find them on our website, because I believe a lot in, in, in just learning from other people's experiences, what has worked, what hasn't worked, what can we learn and improve, uh, and, and, and this is the whole uh, idea behind this effort. So thanks so much for setting this up and, and, and for having me. Thanks, Kelly. Thank you, Etienne. Thank you again to all of our speakers today for their time and their insight and their unwavering dedication to responding to these press, pressing public health issues. I'd like to also extend a warm thank you to all of the audience for their participation and for your dynamic questions and Q&A uh, submissions. We had more than 120 submissions, uh, lots and lots of exciting Q&A out there. And we look forward to being able to continue 
to connect with you. If you'd like to watch the recording of this event or learn more about the Partnership for Healthy Cities, please visit vitalstrategies.org. I'm Kelly Henning, and thank you for joining us today.